Welcome to the Thrive TV Show with Lauren Parsons, helping you boost your health, energy, and productivity. Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Thrive TV. Today, I'm joined by Jason Finucane, who is the founder of Stigma Zero. It's great to have you with us, Jason. Thank you so much, Lauren. It is wonderful to be here. Yeah, fantastic to connect with you all the way over in Canada. So today, we are talking about how mental illness can be treated, but that stigma can actually be cured. Jason's going to share with you why stigma makes the challenge of mental illness infinitely and unnecessarily so much harder, and how mental illness and stigma are having a massive impact in our workplaces and the things that employers can do about it. So I'm really excited to hear your story, for you to share it, and for people to get so much out of this session. But before we dive in, Jason, I'd love to just go through my this and that questions with you, if you're ready for a quick fire round. Sure, sounds good. So just so people can get to know you a little more, tell us, would you prefer Monopoly or chess? Chess. Chess, okay, nice. A month without your car or a month without the internet? Oh, a month without the internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Total detox, that'd be nice, hey? Uh, hot drinks or cold drinks? Ooh, cold drinks. Okay, nice. Shower or bar? Shower. Fantastic. Magazines or newspapers? <sighs> newspapers online, magazines in my hands. Okay, nice, yep. Yeah. Would you rather be able to play 10 different musical instruments beautifully or speak 10 languages fluently? Oh my goodness, uh, 10 languages fluently, I wish. Yeah. Yes, that's me as well, yeah, I wish as well. Taj Mahal or Eiffel Tower? Eiffel Tower. Okay, and snow or rain? Snow. Snow, been yeah. to Canada, somewhat familiar with that, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I don't like rain that much. <laughs> yeah, I know, actually, I think that's a bit of an easy choice, that one. Good, nice to get to know you a little more. So Jason is the author of the book, Jason One, Stigma Zero, My Battle with Mental Illness at Home and in the Workplace. Jason's a mental health advocate, a stigma fighter, a professional speaker, and the founder of Stigma Zero. As someone who's experienced both major physical illness and mental illness, Jason is making this difficult topic really interesting and accessible and consumable. He delivers his personal experiences with impactful storytelling techniques, leaded with rigorous research in order to mobilize knowledge and perspective. And his goal is for everyone to understand this important topic so that you're empowered to make a real change and ultimately join his vision for a future without stigma. So it's a pleasure to have you with us, Jason. Tell us, how did you get started into doing what you're doing now? The short answer is by complete accident. As, as with many things in life, I definitely didn't plan this. The way that I really got into it was to experience two major forms of illness, as you mentioned. A major physical illness when I was a young boy, I actually had a heart defect at nine years old that when I was 12 years old needed to be operated on. I had open heart surgery to correct it. And what I didn't realize at the time was I was learning what it's like in our society to go through a major illness that has absolutely zero stigma attached to it. No one ever questioned my character because my heart wasn't working. I didn't feel shame when my heart wasn't working and I needed to miss school to have this surgery. That was something I learned by accident. I didn't know I was learning it, but later on in my 20s, after many years of, of very good health, I was fortunate that the heart surgery was successful. I had suddenly, and for no apparent reason, there was no trigger, my life was really good at the time, I started experiencing clinical depression. And that symptom of a mental illness for me was actually the, the first step on a path to diagnosis of bipolar disorder, which took almost three years from the first symptom until diagnosis. And the reason it took so long was because of stigma. It was because I, frankly, was part of the problem that I'm now trying to fix. I was one of those people that viewed mental illness as a character flaw. As something that, you know, oh, if you're depressed, you're probably just not trying hard enough or you're, you know, you don't have a positive outlook on life. I didn't understand that it was a biochemical failure in the brain. But when I lived it, and I'll tell you, for two and a half years, I tried very hard and I did everything I could do except ex uh, acknowledge that I might have a mental illness and acknowledge that I might need medical treatment. And I got nowhere. 
I failed utterly. My symptoms just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And finally, I had a manic episode in 2005, which was very dramatic. I didn't sleep for six consecutive days. Wow. Talking, moving, it just was a, a torrent of energy. And my family ended up needing to intervene and get me into a hospital. And I spent three weeks in a psychiatric institution here in Canada. And that's where I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And that's when I finally stopped fighting against the, the, the stigma, against the fear of it. I simply accepted that, you know what? I have an illness. I better start treating it like that. Mm -hmm. And the second I did that, within six months, I was taking treatment that was effective. My symptoms were completely at bay. And I, I actually liken it a little bit to someone who's diabetic. Think of type 1 diabetes. And what would happen to that individual if they didn't take their insulin? For me... Yeah. You know, th th there's no choice in the matter. I had to take medication in order to regulate the biochemistry in my brain. But when I did, the symptoms disappeared. And only after all of that did I wake up one day and realize, why did I react so differently to my mental illness than I did to my physical illness, my heart illness? And it, it just it hit me. It was like a lightning bolt. I realized we as a society are not viewing these two illness types as the same, and they are the same. They're not anyone's fault. They're not happening because a person is lazy. They're happening because a person is unlucky enough that a part of their body isn't functioning properly. And the, the, this is where this statement comes, we can treat mental illness. We can't cure it right now. It's like cancer. Unfortunately, there's no cure, but we absolutely can cure stigma we can eradicate it completely. And that's what I'm trying to contribute to. It's phenomenal. And I can recall the day when you shared this story with me in person at a conference where we met. And it's just, I think it's something it's, we don't often look at it with this perspective to think of other illnesses, like you say, like heart disease, other things we do, we just treat them in a completely different way. And I love what you're doing in the way that you're shifting paradigms. So what was it that really drew you to write your book, which you just brought out, the Stigma Zero book? Yes, so I frankly have always wanted to write a book. I'll, I'll admit that. When I was in high school, I, I, wrote, I wrote poetry, I wrote stories, and I was interested in the idea of writing a book. I will say this, though. I never considered that the book I would write at 43 years old would be about me. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I would write fiction. Um, but what honestly happened was as I began telling my story in keynote form, it became very clear that my story was opening people's minds about how they viewed mental illness. And that could include individuals in the audience who were currently suffering from depression or anxiety or any other mental illness, but it also impacted the caregivers of the individuals who are facing mental illness. The mothers, the fathers, the brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, these are the people who are looking at their loved ones suffering and have, they had no idea what to do or how to react. They may not have stigma necessarily, but they felt lost a bit. And sharing my story was helping these people and that motivated me greatly. And it made me realize that if I put this in book form, I could get it out to a much wider audience and try to help more people uh, just you know, manage this very, very significant challenge in their lives. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we know that it is more prevalent. So what would you say to people that are perhaps suffering or wonder if they're suffering from a mental illness? You know, what are, what are the most common mistakes that you see people making and how can you help them? The first mistake that most people fall into is the one that I fell into hard, which was to think it of, think of it, excuse me, think of it as a failure of some sort. Something's wrong with you. Um, that maybe you are, you know, you should be ashamed of feeling this way. So I'm going to use anxiety as an example. I have some friends who suffered quietly with fairly significant symptoms of anxiety. Every day, all day, they would feel a three on 10 or four on 10 level of anxiety. And they live with that for almost three to four years. And then when they heard my story, they came to me and said, I didn't know you had that. And you know what? I have this. And as soon as they talked about it and started to get over the fear of it, they would seek treatment and they would actually, the symptoms would go away. And so my first thing is to say a mental illness is 
an illness and it's something that needs to be treated either medically or with a change in lifestyle or with a change in diet, it doesn't always have to mean taking a pill, but it does have to mean treating it like it is an illness as opposed to a character flaw. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We should feel any shame whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And can I touch on that point of, you know, those that want to perhaps look at lifestyle, change in lifestyle, change in diet, are there things that you've done along those lines? Are there are there key strategies that have helped you and worked in that area as well? Absolutely. For me, uh, the, the, the medication that I take is one aspect of my management system is what I consider it. I manage bipolar disorder. I'm not cured of it. I, I just simply manage it very well. And the other things, the, the number one thing beside medication is sleep. When you are suffering from any form of a mental illness, it is a brain function. It's a brain illness is what's happening. And your brain needs rest. And so when we sleep, and, and we all have busy lives, many of us out there are parents. Um, you know, there's probably nothing worse for a sleep schedule than having a child, I'm sure. And so the reality is, is, is you have to protect your sleep very, very carefully. And I do that. I make sure that I, first I figured out what is my ideal sleep schedule. You know, some of us, it's six hours. Some of us, it's four. Some of us, it's nine. Whatever your ideal sleep schedule, figure that out and try to maintain it as much as you can. And beyond that, I'll be honest, it's very simple. It's everything in moderation. I don't live like a monk. I don't exercise like a, an Olympic athlete, but I exercise and I eat well. And I enjoy myself, but I do everything in moderation. And I think that that's a very important part of this. Um, the one thing I do say to people is for those who are afraid of taking a medication, make it your last resort, but don't make it something you never consider. Because if you've lived for six straight months trying all other avenues and your symptoms are still present, then medication may be the only recourse for you to live symptom free or at least to control the symptoms. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And I know when you founded Stigma Zero, you wanted to really focus on mental illness in the workplace. Tell me about that. The idea behind the in the workplace part comes with the fact that I was a professional when my symptoms happened. So I was working as a fundraising professional for a major university here in Montreal, and I had a wonderful group of colleagues who respected me, liked me, I was part of a team. But when my illness presented and then I had to take some leaves of absence because of my illness, the stigma started to come around. And it wasn't that anybody was overtly mean to me or rude to me. It wasn't like that. But it was very different, the treatment I received, than any of my colleagues received when they went away because of a virus or because of cancer or any other illness. Those people were treated with respect and dignity and a sense of people rallying around them. We miss you, get well, come back. I was spoken of very more like carefully, like we don't know what to say. You know, it, it, everything was awkward around it. And part of that was my fault because I wasn't speaking openly about my illness. The idea here is we have the opportunity to change the culture in a workplace in a very similar way to, um, I'll use an example of sexual harassment. 30 years ago, sexual harassment was fairly rampant in many workplaces, and it was somewhat accepted. And over time, it, it became known that, no, this behavior is not acceptable, and we need to change that. And so it did change, but it didn't happen overnight. People needed to learn why it was unacceptable and then change their behavior. That's essentially what we're trying to do in ending stigma. So someone who has never experienced clinical depression, they think it is a character flaw, like I used to, that individual needs to be trained to learn about this so that they can change their thinking and then change their behavior. That's yeah, the opportunity. So. And I think that's the interesting thing is that we do have opportunities when you think back generations, we do change our worldview our paradigm shift. You know, we used to think the world was flat once upon yeah, a time. Yeah. Doctors yeah. used to recommend cigarettes as a relaxant. So things do change and that's a really interesting way to look at it. So it's amazing picturing where this is heading and I know your vision of a future with zero stigma. So That's tell me, how do, how do employers actually help to contribute to this? How does an employer help to end stigma in their workplace? Well, at Stigma Zero, what we believe is that there are four realities facing every workplace. It's, it's, it's unavoidable at the moment. And those four realities are 
Mental illness is common, so we know that it's prevalent. That There's statistics significantly uh, that back that up. The second thing is there is stigma in your workplace unless you have specifically trained people to not have it. And the reason I say that is it's not about insulting different workplaces. It's that this is a trap our society has set us up to fall into. So unless you avoid that trap proactively, there is stigma in, in your workplace. But the, the, the last two realities that we look at are it's costing you money. Having a stigma against mental, mental illness from a manager point of view, from a leadership point of view, but also from an employer or sorry, employee point of view, the reality is, is that it increases presenteeism, which is when people come to work when they probably shouldn't, they probably should take a leave and try to address their illness, but they're afraid to admit it. So they, they, they plow on, they soldier on, but they do so at a reduced level of productivity. And then of course there's absenteeism and there's all sorts of other ways that stigma actually is costing companies money on the bottom line. The reality is that a company can do something about all of this. The fourth reality is there is something you can do about it. And what we believe is the most effective way is to offer training. So we've created an online training program. It's fully web-based, can be taken on any device, anywhere. And the idea behind this is a company can purchase subscriptions to our online training program called Create Your Stigma Zero Workplace. And all of their employees, managers, and HR and senior leaders can take this program so that top down, the entire company gets the same training at the same time. The only difference is we have specified modules that are for managers that employees don't see, and we have a specified module for senior HR leaders and, and senior executives that the managers and the employees don't see. And so we've, we've customized it in that way. But the idea is if you train your employees and then reinforce that training over time, within a year or two, you can have a stigma zero workplace, a place where it would be unusual to see somebody speak of mental illness any differently than any other illness. Fantastic. That's great. And so if there are people watching this today, is there anything that you would just say as a final comment, final words of wisdom for anyone either perhaps facing a mental illness themselves or for a friend or a family member? The, the main thing I, I always come back to is one of the greatest uh, bits of fortune that I had in my entire experience with bipolar disorder, which included several months long severe depressive episodes, as well as the manic episode I sp spoke about earlier. Somehow, some way, I never had suicidal thoughts. I don't consider that a badge of honor. That's just a matter of luck, to be honest. The reality is there are people right now who are suffering with some mental illnesses that are considering suicide because they simply can't bear it anymore. And my response to that is there is always hope and you absolutely have an opportunity to try to get ahead of your illness, manage your illness and live well. I'm not saying I live a perfect, healthy life. My illness still affects me in some ways but I manage it in a way where I can live a very fulfilling life. And I hope as many people out there as possible who might be in that state of mind can find a way through. A big part of the reason why I wrote the book and also why I produced the online program is because by sharing my personal story, it offers individuals who currently don't see a light at the end of the tunnel, it offers them an example of, look, I made it through this. There's nothing magical about me. I simply found a way through beating stigma first and foremost, and then I was able to find a treatment that worked for me. And I believe that that path can be taken by many, many others who are suffering from mental illness. Mm -hmm. And I encourage you to do that. If you're a caregiver, I encourage you to not lose hope against, for that person's potential recovery and to never forget that they absolutely can't control the symptoms of their illness. This is not a choice. No mm -hmm. one chooses to have a mental illness. Absolutely. That's, I love that message of hope, really. It is a message of hope for those that are challenged right now or those that you've got someone in your life, a loved one, perhaps. So it sounds like a great idea to head out to grab a copy of your book. Sounds like it needs to be in every workplace as well. So there are links down below that people can connect in with. If people are interested in getting the book, they head to... 
for the book, it's the easiest way is to go to stigmazero.com slash book. And there you'll see a summary of the book and links to the retail outlets that are selling it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Jason. It's been such a pleasure to have you with me today. I know that there'll be a lot of people out there hugely encouraged by the message that you've shared and that message of hope. And I certainly want to join with you and create a society and communities and workplaces and families where the stigma is dropped and where people can really move forward. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren. I really appreciate your invitation to be on your show. And thanks to everyone who watches this and, and listens. Uh, I hope you found it interesting and helpful. Thanks so much. Fantastic. So that's another episode of Thrive TV. Go out and thrive and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Thrive TV show with Lauren Parsons. Visit thrivetvshow.com to access the show notes and discover our fantastic bonus content. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next inspiring episode.